And if you want to follow along with us, Philippians is where you want to be. In the text that Adam read for us just a moment ago, Philippians chapter 1. I got a question for you this morning. And uh, it's a biggie. I mean, this really is a huge, huge question that I want to ask you. That question is this. What do you live for? That's the question. I want you to think about it. What do you live for? Uh, You don't live very long, and so what is your main focus in life? What do you care about more than anything else? What do you live for? Now, Paul's going to answer that question for us. He's going to tell us what he lives for in, in a verse that is, without a doubt, one of the most noted and one of the most quoted, one of the most popular passages in the entire New Testament. And, uh, and the reason that it's so popular, the reason it's so well known, the reason that it's so often quoted is because it is an incredibly profound verse. And you'll find that in verse 21 here in chapter 1. Look at it. Here's Paul's answer to the question. Paul, what do you live for? Paul says, for to me, to live is Christ. That's what he lives for. That's what's more important to Paul than anything else on the face of the earth. He's all about Jesus. Uh, He wants to honor Jesus. He wants to glorify Jesus in his life. Uh, He wants to reflect Jesus. He wants to look like Jesus. He wants to tell others about Jesus. He wants to promote Jesus. He is all about Jesus. And as you watch his life unfold on the pages of the New Testament, uh, that just becomes obvious. He's all about living for Jesus. For instance, just kind of hold your place there in Philippians and turn back to the book of Acts. And I want you to go to chapter 20 in the book of Acts. Paul's coming off his third missionary journey when we get to chapter 20, and Luke's telling us all about that. And he says, uh, he's making his way toward Jerusalem. And, and as he's heading toward Jerusalem, he and his uh, ministry team, his evangelistic team, they stop off at a place called Miletus. And while they're at Miletus, uh, he sends a message to the church at Ephesus, and he wants to talk to the elders. And, and he says, come down here, guys, because I need to talk to you. There's something on my heart I want to tell you. And so they come to Miletus, and, and they meet him. And as he's talking to them, watch what he says in verse 24. This is someone who is consumed with Jesus Christ. This is someone who is living for Jesus Christ. Verse 24, But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly to the gospel of the grace of God. I don't consider my life to be of any significance to me. He says, that's not what I'm about. I don't don't really care about that. I care about one thing, he says. I care about my ministry. I care about my mission. I care about Christ. I want people to hear Christ from me. I want people to see Christ in me. Everything else that's just noise... I'm all about Christ. Well, if you look at Acts chapter 21, the very next chapter, you're you're seeing this this passion just continue to ooze from every pore in his body. He finally gets to Jerusalem in chapter 21, or he gets close to Jerusalem, I should say. He's back in the area of Judea. He he lands at the, the port city of Caesarea, It says in verse 8 of chapter 21, On the next day we left and came to Caesarea. While he was in Caesarea, he stayed at the house of Philip. We we know Philip from Acts chapter 6. He's a gospel preacher where he's introduced there. And 
in chapter 6. He has four daughters we learn here from Luke in, in chapter 21. And while he's staying there with Philip and Philip's family, it says in verse 10 that a prophet of God came down from Jerusalem, a man by the name of Agabus. And look what it says in verse 11. He delivers a message to Paul and the Christians there who are living in Caesarea. And coming to us, he, that is Agabus, took Paul's belt, and he bound his own hands, and he bound his feet, and he said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Uh, That's pretty ominous. Uh, That's a guarantee. Here's what's going to happen to the owner of this belt. Paul, this is going to happen to you. As you make your way to Jerusalem, this is what's going to happen. Well, all of his friends and and the church there in Caesarea, they're suddenly terrified. They fear for his life. And so they, they begin to beg him. In fact, that's what verse 12 says. When he had heard this, we as well as the local residents... Now notice the we there that that Luke uses. Luke's doing this as well. They want Paul to change his mind. They want Paul to change his plans. Look, go somewhere else. Go talk to someone someone else. Go, Go spend time somewhere else, but avoid Jerusalem. This is a message from God. He he's he's tipping you off. He's showing you you don't need to go to Jerusalem, they're thinking. They're begging him not to go up. And watch what Paul says in verse 13. What are you doing, he says, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to go bound, to go to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. You know why he could say that? I'm going. I'm ready. I'm ready to be arrested for Christ. I'm ready to die for Christ. The reason he could say that is because he lives for Christ. He's consumed with Christ. Christ is the only thing that matters to him. Okay, that's Paul. Now back to you. Now my question to you is, what do you live for? How would you complete this sentence? To me, for me, to live is blank. Fill it in. You got to fill it in. How are you going to fill that in? For me, to live is blank. And be honest. Because you've got to fill it in. You, you live for something. We all live for something. What are you gonna what are you gonna fill in the blank with? Now to be honest, if we're gonna be just be brutally honest with each other in a in an audience this size, there's a lot of different things that we'll find its way into that blank. A lot of cheap substitutes for Christ. For me, to live is money. Nobody wants to say that. But if we're real honest with ourselves, a lot of people can fill in the blank with that word. For me to live is stuff. It's the stuff that money can buy. It's the most important thing in my life. It's all I think about. For me to live is sexual pleasure. The most important thing in my life. Pursue it wherever, whenever. That's the most important thing. Some people can feel that in that blank. A lot of people fill that blank in with that. For me to live is power. For me to live is popularity. 
fame, prestige. For me, to live is entertainment. I live for entertainment. I just want to have fun. I, I mean, you got to fill in the blank with something. That's your, that's your homework. How do you fill in the blank? How do you complete the sentence? For me, to live is blank. Now listen, if that's the only blank that you have to fill in, fill it in with whatever you want. Honestly, it doesn't matter. Fill it in with money. If that's the only blank that you have to fill in, fill it in with money. Go for it. Fill it in with stuff. Fill it in with sexual... Pl- go for it. If that's the only blank that you have to fill in, go for it. Fill it in with power. Fill it in with power. Fill it in with popularity. If that's the only blank, you want to be popular, do whatever it takes. Go ahead, fill it in. It's no biggie. If that's the only blank you got to fill in, fill it in. Entertainment, by all means. You want to have fun? You want, is, it, is life just all about fun? If, look, put it in the blank. If that's the only blank that you have to fill in, why not? Go ahead and do it. Uh, You know, I was reading something just the other day that the late Stephen Hawking said. You remember him? He, He died a few weeks ago. The prominent cosmologist, the world renowned astrophysicist. So many people consider him to be the smartest human being on the planet. I was reading about kind of his view of spiritual things. And, and he said, look, you're just, a, you're just an, a, an advanced... We're just an advanced species of monkey. That's all you are. That's all you are. You're just here by unguided, mindless, purposeless forces. You're just a happy accident. You're just lucky that some kind of mutation from a monkey made you. That's all you are. And he said, there is no afterlife. There is no heaven. Listen, if he's right, fill in the blank with whatever. If you're just an advanced form of monkey, and you're just going to... And that's it. By all, fill it in with Whatever. But he's not right. He is very wrong. You're not just an advanced form of monkey. You are a creation of the infinitely holy God. He created you in His image. Genesis chapter 1 beginning in verse 26 tells us that that God created you in His image, in His likeness. You have God's stamp on you. And by the sovereign will of God, He has decreed that you will live forever. You are not just merely going to die. By His will, you are going to live forever. And uh, God wants you to live forever with Him. He wants to bless you forever. He wants to bless you with a perfect body and a perfect mind, a perfect spirit in a perfect world. That's God's plan. And have perfect fellowship with Him. For all of eternity. That's what he wants. But sin has entered the world and it has corrupted you. And because God is morally perfect, because he is moral perfection, he can't live in the presence of sin. And he's infinitely just, he's perfect. He has to punish sin. He doesn't want to, he wants to save you. But if you refuse that, you're going to still die and you're still going to live forever, but you're going to be separate from him in a Christless hell. So as you think about now that blank that you have to fill in, for me to live is blank, you have to realize there's a second blank you have to fill in. You have to. Because that's reality. 
And we see that second blank also here in Philippians chapter 1. Paul says, for to me, to live is Christ. He fills in that first blank with Christ. And he says, and to die, it's gain. As he thinks about that first blank, it has implications for the second blank. He's going to die, he's going to live forever, and because he filled in the first blank with Christ, the second blank is going to be great. It's gain. He's going to gain everything. Now as you're trying to figure it out, what you're going to put in that first blank, you need to kind of, whatever you put in, you need to think of the implications of the second blank as well, okay? For me to live is money... Okay, and to die is being broke and eternally lost. Wait, 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 just a minute. I got the first part. Yeah, okay, I know you can't take it with you, but you said it's too it's broke and eternal. It is, it is. Because not only are you going to die, you're going to, again, by God's sovereign decree, you're going to live forever. Uh, We're reminded of that. Turn over to Luke chapter 12. That's what the blank has to be. If you choose that, the blank has to be filled in this way. Look at Luke chapter 12 here. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus is trying to get people to think about these blanks they're filling in their lives with. The first blank and the second blank. And so uh, he tells about this this rich man who was, man, he had it all. He had a bumper crop, especially one year. And and so in verse 17, he started thinking to himself, what in the world am I going to do? I don't have any place to store all of this stuff. I'm just, man, money's falling out of my pockets. I just leave a trail of cash wherever I go. What am I going to do? Oh, okay. I'll build a bigger storehouse for it. And so that's what he did. This is what I'll do, verse 18. I'll tear down my barns, I'll build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. For... Me to live is money. For me to live is ease. For me to live is pleasure. Oh, but he forgot the second blank. But God said in verse 20, You fool. Oh, you messed up the first blank. And now that second blank is you're broke. This very night your soul will be required of you. And now who will own what you've prepared? You don't get to take it with you. You're broke. So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Your soul is required for you. Not only are you broke, your soul's required for you. Okay, fill in the blank. What you li- what you living for? Stuff? For me to live is stuff. Okay. And to die is being broke and eternally lost. You you really want that? For to me, for me to live is sexual pleasure. All right. Okay. And to die is no more pleasure and be eternally lost. You you good with that? For me to live is entertainment. All right. And to die is no more fun and eternally lost. 
You good with that? For me to live is power. And to die is powerless and be eternally lost. Sound good? For me to live is popularity. And to die is no more popularity and be eternally lost. For me to live is beauty. Okay. And to die is no more beauty and to be rotting and to be eternally lost. You good with that? Now listen, everything that we've mentioned, everything that we've said, whether it's sexual pleasure or, or stuff or, or beauty or, or family or, or position and power, none of those things inherently are wrong as long as we're stewards over them and they don't consume our hearts and minds. But the problem is they so easily can become idols into our lives. And we think about, of course, Matthew chapter 19 and that rich young ruler who thought he was living for Christ, but he really wasn't. And so Jesus pulls open his heart and he shows him, Master, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Well, keep the commandments. Oh, I've done that. Is there anything else? Sure. Yes, sell everything that you have and give it to the poor and come after, come after me, follow me. And he turned around and he went away, the text says, because he had so much. These things can become so much idols in our lives. Listen, why would you spend so much time Focusing your life, giving so much of your energy, so much of your attention, so much of your treasure into pursuing things that the pleasure and the blessing of all of that will stop at the grave. Why don't you give yourself to the one thing that will keep blessing you for a billion years. Listen, the only thing that you can put in that first blank, for me to live is blank. There's only one thing that you can put in that blank that's going to take the sting out of death. And that is Christ. And that's why Paul could say, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, one of the greatest passages in all of the Bible as Paul is writing there in verse 55 and he, and he talks about, oh death, where is your sting? Well, it, there's none when you fill in that first blank with Christ. There's none. And when you fill in that first blank with Christ, you're going to be like Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4 where he's writing his last letter and he's, right, he's there at the end of life. And he says, I'm being poured out like a drink offering in verses 6 through 8. The time of my departure, it's here. And there's no dread. He says, I, I have I've finished the course. I've fought a good fight. Now there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Not to me only, but to everyone who loves His appearing. To everyone who fills in the first blank with Christ. Paul knew that dying was about being with Christ. When you live for Christ, death is not an enemy. That, that outlook made Paul absolutely unstoppable. And you can just imagine how it just frustrated his op uh, opponents. You can almost imagine the conversations they would have. Paul, we hate you. And we hate your Messiah. And we're going to kill you. To which Paul would respond, ha, ha, yes, all right, yeah, man, dying is gain, bring it on, uh, okay, we're going to let you live, Paul, how about that, yes, that's great too. Because when you let me live, I get to tell more people about Christ. I get to share Christ more. I get to talk about Christ more. 
I get to let people see Christ living in me more. Maybe it'll change their lives and they'll come to know Christ and they'll fill in the first blank with Christ. And then they, when they die, it'll be gain. Yeah. Okay, Paul. We're going to let you live, but we're going to make your life miserable. We're going to make you suffer. I cannot imagine Paul would say, the suffering of this life is nothing to be compared with the glory that God has prepared for me. What a joy it is to be considered worthy to suffer for Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah, it just it had to drive him crazy. It was an unstoppable mentality. And that mentality can be yours if you treasure Jesus Christ above all else. As I said, it's the only thing that you can fill in that first blank with. It's going to make that second blank that you have to fill in to make it wonderful. If you put anything else in that first blank, that second blank is going to be awful. When I think about living a life for Christ, I, I can't help but to think about a very familiar prayer. I'm sure many of you have seen it before. Sometimes it's called an Irish prayer. Sometimes it's called the prayer of St. Patrick. But when I, when I read it, I think this is what Paul means. This is what he means when he says for me to live as Christ. I'm going to read you just a little teeny tiny snippet, a portion of it. As I rise today, may the strength of God pilot me. May Christ shield me today. Christ with me. Christ before me. Christ behind me. Christ in me. Christ beneath me. Christ above me. Christ on my right. Christ on my left. Christ when I lie down. Christ when I sit. Christ when I stand. Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me. Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me. Christ in every eye that sees me. Christ in every ear that hears me. Amen. That's what it means to live for Christ. How about you this morning? Is that honestly what is in that first blank in your life. If it is not, may I plead with you to put Christ authentically in that first blank. If you do, the second blank is going to be awesome. You're going to gain. But if you put anything else in that first blank, that second blank is going to be Awful. So I invite you this morning to put Christ in the first blank. You do that by first of all obeying the gospel. If you haven't done that, do it right now. If you believe that He's the Christ and you're willing to surrender yourself to Him and, and, and in that penitent faith be buried with Him in baptism for the forgiveness of sins, do it right now. Put Him first. For me to live is Christ. That's where it begins. If you've done that but... No longer is Christ in that, if you're being honest with you, no longer is He your passion. No longer does your life revolve around Him. Not, not, no longer are you trying to be a Christian doctor, a Christian lawyer, a Christian husband, a Christian wife, a Christian accountant, a Christian farmer, a Christian... If Christ isn't the first thing in your life, it's time to put Him back there. If you need to do that where you're sitting, do it today. But if you need to get him back in a more public way, please do it. We want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. Fill in the blank with Christ so that your death will be gained. If you need to do something this morning, do it right now while together we stand.